Uh, my name is Charlene, and I work at the Clean Foundation, and I work on a number of projects. One of which is a program called Ship to Shore, and that engages the that program engages with with fishers across the province. Uh, so yeah, I work at Clean. I want to tell you a little bit about Clean. Uh, we work to inspire environmental change. And as you can see by our slide here, we host a range of programs, and our goal is to see the big picture while still taking action at the grassroots level. So today I'm going to talk to you about three main things, basically, with other stuff filled in. Um, I'll be talking about the issue of marine pollution and how that sort of informs our Ship to Shore program. And then also talk about how our program, I think, uh, uses a unique approach to engagement uh, that can be an example of two-way ocean literacy, or I like to call it. So, the problem. Uh, I'm in a room with a lot of people who know what the problem is in regards to marine pollution. We have an increase in the amount of plastics uh, being created. We're living in a disposable culture. And so, the sheer amount of plastics entering our ocean every year is insurmountable. The World Economic Forum, which, and as well, uh, in partnership with the Ellen McCarthy Foundation, they recently re released a report in January stating that by 2050 there will be more plastic in the ocean by fish. So that's pretty scary, and that's pretty daunting. And uh, the report further went on to say that uh, at least 8 million tons of plastic leak into the ocean every year, which is the equivalent to dumping the contents of one garbage truck into the ocean every minute. So that's scary. And uh, that's why we have these great outreach programs going on. And so where's most of this pollution coming from? They say that it's estimated that 80% of the marine pollution that ends up in the ocean is actually starting out on land. So that gives us some things to think about. And when it comes to marine pollution, several countries have taken action to address it. Uh, there are international treaties that are, are trying to uh, tackle this. Um, internationally, with marine pollution, though, I find that a lot of the treaties aren't necessarily dealing or targeting land-based activities, so they're not necessarily addressing the main contributor to marine pollution. And if you look at Canada, for instance, from a federal point of view, we've signed international treaties, and despite the fact that we have the most men coastline uh, in the world, uh, and the fact that there are efforts, you know, individual efforts within different provinces and different great things happening within the country, there isn't any coherent strategy or coordinated effort between agencies sort of tackling this issue. And then if we look at the province, uh, we have regulations that pertain to land-based sources of pollution, but with this growing amount of stuff, uh, there are a lack of resources to deal with this, and compared to other environmental issues, litter or land-based sources of marine pollution, they're not deemed a high priority. And generally, marine litter on land isn't necessarily as uh, the implications of litter on land aren't the same as the implications of litter in our oceans. So what are some of these issues? Um, we have marine pollution uh, obviously causes risks to marine wildlife as well as the environment through ingestion and we've all know how uh, plastic and marine wildlife swallowing plastic can cause starvation and then death. We know that plastic can attract and carry other pollutants. Uh, we know that plastics can be a vector for invasive species. Not to, the, not to mention the effect that uh, the effects of oil production have that go into making plastic and, and the issues with that. And so with the Ship to Shore, we deal a lot with marine plastic in the ocean. And so do our fishers that we work with. Um, also, fishing gear is a problem, or ghost gear, which is known as any, which is referred to as any discarded, lost, or abandoned fishing gear that ends up in the marine environment. And if you were to look at the, the profile of waste in the ocean, the, the fishing-related contribution is small, but the fact that fishing gear is designed to fish uh, poses big problems for, uh, for fishers. Um, it continues to fish and trap uh, our fish stocks. It also uh, impacts marine habitat, it damages vessels, it's a navigational hazard. And then even in Nova Scotia, for example, and we deal with this a lot with our work um, and, you know, at a local level, harbors across the province face a bunch of challenges when it comes to waste management. As you can see, we have uh, numerous harbors deal with overflowing dumpsters, illegal dumping, mixed waste, burning, um, and waste being thrown overboard. And another thing is, 
all this waste washing up along our shorelines and, and sort of ruining the appearance of our shorelines, which is a threat to tourism revenues and, uh, and public beaches especially. Which brings us to Trip to Shore and what this program is. So years ago, uh, these problems that I mentioned, they were all identified by a group of concerned fishers who recognized the need to change the way waste was managed within the commercial fishing industry. And for that reason, Ship to Shore was born. Um, the program began as a grassroots initiative uh, by individuals who created what still exists today, but the Marine Waste Management Committee. And we have representation from ourselves, DFO, DFA, the municipal waste educators, the province, um, as well as the fishing industry. And this is key, I think, to what makes our program work. And so together, our committee, we work to address the concerns of waste management at sea and on land. And as I said, Ship to Shore is a collaborative project, and we have brought different agencies together and different stakeholders with different mandates to achieve a common goal. And this is a photo of um, just sort of our map, and these, these different numbers are the different waste regions in Nova Scotia. I'm, I'm the waste coordinator at Clean, so I, I deal with waste and I deal with people and waste. Uh, so a lot of people don't know that our waste world is broken up into different regions, which I think is interesting. So yeah, we work with, uh, for our program, we work with DFO Small Craft Harbor representatives, we work with Harbor Authority managers, and we work with waste educators across the province to develop workable solutions to the waste management issue in the industry. And so our goal was to shore, all these stakeholders we came together and we you know, had to decide what our goal was, and it was to engage fishers and change their behaviors in a way that was better for the environment, but also better for the livelihood. And so we want to improve waste infrastructure uh, and develop best waste management practices, both at the harbors and at sea. And also instilling feelings of stewardship uh, within the fishing community. And we do this by engaging with harbor authority managers as well as fishers. We do, we do it all. We go to presentations, fishing events, engagement booths, and then we have one-on-one -on -one surveys as well. So as anyone in Nova Scotia probably knows, and those who aren't from Nova Scotia, but the fishing industry here is historically, culturally, economically vital to this province. Um, it, the fishing industry, or this sector, is made of small business people in rural communities that offer a really strong export commodity. And fishers that belong to this sector, they do hard work, they do seasonal work, they're a diverse group of people, uh, they're a mix of young and old, uh, they're families that have been involved in it for gener multiple generations, they have various levels of education, uh, various backgrounds, and they have various reasons to be doing what they're doing. All that aside though, all fishermen are key proponents to a healthy ocean. They live the ocean, they breathe the ocean, and their livelihoods absolutely depend on the ocean. And because of this, they know the ocean better than many of us do, or many of the general public do. Uh, scientists, academics, groups like us are constantly recruiting fishers to learn more about our oceans. Fishers feed and provide their families from, from the ocean, so consequently, they have the most to lose. Now fishers have, have seen their sector change drastically in regards to fish stocks, but as well in regards to waste management. Uh, fishing related materials were once made of textiles, for example. They, things used to be made out of wood and fiber, whereas today most of the fishing gear that we deal with is made of synthetic materials. Everything's coated in plastic. We have polypropylene, polyethylene, nylon, you name it. Uh, we have bait boxes, you know, it looks like cardboard, but that is lined with plastic as well. So everything that the fishers are now working with uh, no longer biodegrade like they once did. So it makes sense that fishers would be having challenges with waste management over the years and throughout all these changes. There was once a time when throwing fishing gear overboard was a more acceptable because back then the gear wasn't made of stuff that was persistent and synthetic and able to absorb and move up our food chain and then we're eating it. Also, years ago, there wasn't all that much stuff out there in the first place. Uh, we live in a disposable culture now, uh, with so much more packaging materials being created, so it's a lot harder for all of us, municipalities, governments, us, to manage our waste and sort it. It's really hard. And also, back in, uh, in 1995, Nova Scotia was innovative when we uh, implemented great changes in regards to waste management in the province. And it was amazing. Diverted all this waste from going into the landfill. Um, 
close. Every time. So, um, <laughs> uh, so that being said, with all this innovation with waste management, it didn't really, oh my gosh, uh, it didn't really work with fishers in mind. Um, so they today are facing high disposal costs, confusion about sorting, lack of infrastructure, and uh, most fishing gear uh, ending up in the landfill. So we try to help fishers better understand how to manage their waste. And they already know this though. When we spoke to fishers, they told us they care about reducing their impact on the ocean. They want to protect the fishing industry for future generations. They want to protect the marine environment. They believe that morally it's the right thing to do. And they take pride in their community. So for these reasons, waste disposal habits have improved. Which brings me to this two-way form of dialogue that I say our program sort of does. Um, we have a dialogue with our fishers and that informs our program. The fishers talk to us. As you can see here, we have a waste educator talking to a fisher. And they're sharing their stories with us, their struggles and the challenges they face with waste management, whether it's at the harbor or at sea. And we can't fix all these problems, that's why we have our stakeholders and our waste educators and DFO coming out to help us out. And we invite and we work with them uh, to get an all-round look at uh, some real potential solutions. And based on that in-depth knowledge that we gather from the fishers, uh, we can then develop and design our program and tailor our solutions in a way that directly speak to, and speak to the specific barriers or any knowledge gaps that they may have. And so we work to understand our audience and figure out what messaging works. And so we conduct follow-up, we evaluate, we ask more questions to ensure that our solutions are in fact working. And I feel this is the only way a program like this would work. We could come up with a solution, but if we are not learning from the fishers what they need, then those solutions would be vague, they wouldn't be connected to anything, it would be connected to them, and their work wouldn't last. So when I say two-way communication, um, we learn from them and they learn from us. So what can we teach them? We can educate fishers on the impacts of fishing waste, such as ghost gear or mi microplastics and how that might affect commercial fish species. We help them manage their waste and uh, especially the hard to manage waste issue, uh, items. Uh, we help them with sorting. We can act as a liaison between government officials and uh, municipalities and fishers so that we can all come up with workable solutions. But we also provide tools to these fishers and help them inspire change within their community. So we identify uh, influential people within the community and we use, those as, we use them as champions uh, with the hope that they can use those tools and then diffuse, hopefully, those social norms without the, throughout the community um, and really make change that we're hoping for. And we also learn from them. Uh, we, they help us design our program. We ask them all these questions and figure out, okay, what barriers are we going to address? And, and they tell us, and therefore we design our program that way. They also help us with our own research. Uh, we're currently, for example, looking at the feasibility of repurposing fishing gear in Nova Scotia. So with this research, fishers have been so helpful in helping us determine the type of fishing gear that's being used in this province, uh, what that gear is made of, what happens to that gear at the end of its life, so that we can hopefully figure out uh, any best solutions that uh, come up with best solutions to deal with this fishing gear if those best practices are, haven't already been identified. So that's what I mean by a two-way dialogue. Um, we don't just have all this knowledge that we want to uh, pass down to them. We have a conversation with them and we identify what we don't know and we identify what they might not know and we talk to them about it. And we incorporate a lot of stakeholders as well to help with that. And I just want to end with one story, so good I have a minute. Um, Last summer, we did a cleanup near Digby, uh, and this harbor had been uh, visited earlier in the season, and it was identified that there was a lot of waste around, a lot of litter, so we should do uh, a cleanup that engaged with the fishers and got them involved so that they could actually you know, see what was there. And uh, so we came in that day, and a number of fishers showed up, and there was one fisher who was particularly disgruntled, and he was really not happy with having to be there, but the harbor authority manager uh, had enticed him to come out, or forced him to come out, while and told him, maybe. Um, <laughs> so he was there, and he was not happy. Uh, from his perspective, his harbor was clean, and this event was completely unnecessary, especially given the fact he's a busy man, he's a fisherman, and he has a lot of work to do. Despite all that, he participated in the cleanup, and over the course of two hours, 
a dozen of us had cleaned the harbor up and managed to fill the back of two pickup trucks full of garbage. And uh, <laughs> you just, wait, just get to the end. Um, we were all ready to go home. We're like, great job, great job. And we you know, were ready to leave. And that once disgruntled fisherman came up to my colleague and he shook her hand and he thanked her profusely for inviting her to come out to that cleanup. Because what we had done was we had helped him see what he couldn't see before. And to think of what Alan said last night about what people think about the environment, and when it comes to big environmental issues, I find it all very daunting. Um, but on a local level, and when moments like that happen, uh, it helps me and hopefully everyone else, uh, you know, what, if they have moments like that, to uh, to be present and have the present be meaningful. And so it gives me hope to keep doing what we're doing. So that's it. Thank you.